Hey, kids cook real food. Katie Kimball here. And oh, who's tired? Are you with me, mamas? Are you with me, dads? Yeah, my husband and I had a joke maybe 10, 15 years ago. He had read an article that talked about parents being bone tired. And he was like, that's it. That's it. So at the end of the day, sometimes we'll be like, I am bone tired because we just get drained at times. And that's why I'm so glad to have Dr. Isabella Wentz with us today. She's known as the thyroid pharmacist, but you may not know that your thyroid is very connected to your adrenals, which is very connected to your energy, which is what we get to dive into today. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Isabella. Thank you so much, Katie, for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we both are. We know we're looking chipper. We're at least faking it that we have lots of energy, but uh, we, we definitely want to talk about that, that mom and dad overwhelm, that brain fog that sometimes we feel and that bone tired fatigue. So I'm going to officially introduce you to the audience, and then we will hop right into this topic of adrenal fatigue. Dr. Isabella Wentz is a compassionate, innovative, solution-focused, integrative pharmacist. First pharmacist I've had on the Healthy Parenting Connector, which is kind of fun. She's dedicated to finding the root causes of chronic health conditions, and this stems, guys, from her own diagnosis with Hashimoto's thyroid in 2009 after a decade of truly deb debilitating symptoms. I don't know if we'll get deep into the, like that story, but read Isabella's story, it's um, it's really difficult to read even and imagine what it was like to be that young 20-something girl who nobody could figure out what was wrong with you. So my heart goes out to you, but I love that you were able to figure yourself out, heal yourself, and then you're like, I have to share this with others. And Dr. Wentz shares this with several best-selling books, New York Times bestseller Hashimoto's thyroid Thyroiditis, Lifestyle Interventions for Finding and Treating the Root Cause, and then a number one New York Times bestseller, Hashimoto's Protocol, the 90-day plan for reversing thyroid symptoms and getting your life back, and then the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Hashimoto's Food Pharmacology, Nutrition Protocols, and Healing Recipes to Take Charge of Your Thyroid Health. Now, Dr. Isabella's latest book, The Adrenal Transformation Protocol, is released April 18th, 2023. So depending on when you're listening to this, it could be soon or in the past. And this book focuses on resetting the body's stress response. We're going to talk today about the targeted safety signals and a little bit about the four-week program that's already helped 3,500 plus individuals. This program this is an amazing success rate, Dr. Isabella. I'm so impressed. Over 80% of participants improving brain fog, fatigue, anxiety, irritability, sleep issues, and libido, throwing that one in there. Um, so you've been known as the thyroid pharmacist. What's just like a, the little short story, the short version of the long story behind that? Mm. So I was never interested in the thyroid gland during pharmacy school. I was like, okay, I'm more interested in the conditions that require lots of different drugs, right? But when I was in my 20s, I started to have some, some chronic health issues. I had fatigue, brain fog, irritable bowel syndrome, and things just got worse year after year after year until finally I got to the point where I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's. I was thankful for that diagnosis and excited to start medications, but they only helped me a little bit. So I slept instead of 12 hours, I, I only needed 11 hours of sleep, right? Um, but I still had brain fog and fatigue and, and carpal tunnel and anxiety, panic attacks, just like all of these crazy symptoms in my 20s. And so I started focusing on lifestyle changes and trying to research what I could do to help myself feel better. And thankfully through that process, I was able to get myself into remission. And I was like, wow, I didn't learn any of this in pharmacy school. Why isn't this being taught all over the world? And so I came out with my first book, The Hashimoto's Root Cause. And in a bit of a full circle moment, I was just doing some continuing education for my, for, uh, my pharmacy license. And I came across a module on, on hypothyroidism and they were actually using my work to create the module to teach other pharmacists on how to approach people with Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, utilizing not just medications, but also lifestyle. So, um, so now I'm ready to take on the next condition, right? That is amazing. I can't even imagine how that must've felt. You did not know that that was going to be in your coursework in that book that you no, were in there? Yeah. I just had to pick 30 hours and I was like, okay, let me pick things that I'm interested in. And I'm like, Oh, there's something on thyroid. I, I wonder what they have to say about that. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I made I made it to the, like the references section. And I was like, this is actually really good. And they actually talk about some of these things that help. 
So um, I don't know how many pharmacists have taken this, but but it's just been incredible that this is out there and available and people are so much more aware of some of the lifestyle things that can help them get their thyroid issues into remission. That gives me so much hope. I'm hopeful that not only is this in the you know pharmacological textbooks and courses, but also in the things that MDs are taking, because obviously as a pharmacist, you probably don't get to talk to a lot of patients, you know, and really coach them in lifestyle. But man, if we can make sure that that's full circle everywhere in the conventional medical system, that is good news. I love that. We're like, I was so excited to get on the drugs because that makes, it makes sense, right? You were a pharmacist and yeah. what a, what a beautiful thing that you were able to use your bent for research and figure it out. Do, do most conventional medical professionals see thyroid issues as reversible or not? No, they don't. Unfortunately, in, in many cases with hypothyroidism and underactive thyroid, people are given a prescription medication that does work well for some people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But for others, it is something that um, helps them a little bit. And then they still struggle with various symptoms. And the, the challenge I have with conventional medicine is a lot of times people don't connect the dots. So people will have, let's say fatigue because their thyroid medication isn't helping them. And their doctor will say, well, okay, well, maybe you need to go to a psychiatrist because you might be depressed. And there are things like depression, anxiety, fatigue, um, miscarriages, fertility challenges, um, GI distress. A lot of these things are actually connected. And then the conventional medical model is basically take a medication and you're probably going to have to increase your doses of medication as your body, um, gets under this autoimmune thyroid attack and further destroys your thyroid gland. And at some point you may even progress to another autoimmune condition. So what I love about functional medicine is we focus on what is the root cause of my condition and how do we really get a person to thriving instead of just being in survival mode and being dependent on a lot of medications now. And I'm, I'm the person that will say, sometimes you need medications and that's great but there's a lot of things that lifestyle and figuring out the root cause can do that may work better than medication in many cases. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty about that and about how, you know, really a lot of conventional medicine is, is sort of that splitting. Like you had irritable bowel, you would have been sent to the gastroenterologist. You have an autoimmune disease you're, you're sent, you know, but our bodies don't split that way. <laughs> That's not, it's not how it works. And that is the beauty of functional medicine. So fatigue is a big symptom for thyroid issues, fatigue is a primary symptom for adrenals. Is that kind of where the bridge happens or where your bridge happened going from thyroid to adrenals? Yeah. So one of the, when I, I, my own personal health journey was focusing on figuring out what I could do to get myself to feel better, you know, whether it was utilizing medications or some integrative medicine, heck, I even considered like voodoo at the time. Right. So, um, the, the, one of the things I came across was adrenal fatigue and I had already been utilizing the dairy free and gluten free diet. And that helped me so much. It helped me reduce my irritable bowel syndrome and acid reflux, but yet I was still dealing with fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so the term adrenal fatigue was brought up to me and I like, kind of like did a Google search and the, the medical site said it didn't exist, but I was like, but wait a minute, all the symptoms that, you know, of this condition that doesn't exist, I actually have, right? And so I came across adrenal fatigue and, and did what was recommended and that helped me significantly. Mm -hmm. Then as I went on to work with thyroid patients and people with thyroid issues, I would find that more than 90% of them had some sort of adrenal fatigue. And then as, as people that I you know knew in my past or just other, other individuals started coming to me, they were like, well, I don't have a thyroid issue but I have these like adrenal symptoms. I have fatigue. I have all of these things. Can you help me? And so that's kind of how my work evolved is in helping people with, with thyroid issues, getting their adrenals balanced. Most people with, with a thyroid condition, with chronic autoimmune conditions, with chronic fatigue syndrome, they're going to have some de degree of adrenal dysfunction, but so can people without a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times the adrenal fatigue is kind of what is a process that begins before a person gets diagnosed with autoimmunity. And my hope and thought is that if I can help somebody in that adrenal fatigue state, that we could prevent other, we can help all their symptoms 
feel like they're thriving and then prevent other kinds of autoimmune conditions. Fantastic. So root cause oriented. Let's um let's go textbook a little bit for the audience because we've been talking about this phrase adrenal fatigue or adrenal dysfunction, but maybe I don't know what an adrenal is. Maybe I don't know what this term means. Can we can we do a little definition game here? Of course. So the adrenals are two glands that sit on top of our kidneys and they produce our stress hormones. And we need these stress hormones to survive and to thrive. When we have too much of them, that could be a problem. But also when we don't make enough of them, that could be a problem too. So adrenal dysfunction is, is which way? Too much or too little? Um, adrenal dysfunction could be either way. So okay. depending on the stage of adrenal dysfunction, people may, um, people typically hear like cortisol is bad and it's, it's only problematic when we have too much of it. And some people with adrenal dysfunction may be producing too much cortisol, right? And they feel like super wired. Like I just drank like six cups of coffee. I'm irritable. Everybody's annoying and I can't sleep at night. That's typically the presentation for that person. Um, that happens when we're under a lot of stress. As, as time goes on and the stress continues, our body starts to adapt and say, you know what? Like we can't be in this like high, crazy cortisol state. Let's see if we can balance things out a little bit. And then people end up um, getting on what I call a cortisol roller coaster where they might have a lot of um, like jump out of bed anxious. And then they have um, fatigue later on in the day, and then they have trouble sleeping and they, they just kind of feel usually moody and irritable. And, um, as that progresses, sometimes people might have trouble waking up in the morning, then trouble sleeping. And then in the, the people that I have worked with, with, um, autoimmunity, a lot of times they'll just be tired all day and then they'll be tired at night. They'll sleep a long time, but the sleep is unrefreshing. And the next morning they're tired as well. So there, there could be a few different ways this presents. And it, essentially what it is, is that for whatever reason, the communication pathway between our brain and our adrenal glands is disconnected and the adrenal glands are not producing the right amounts of hormone to keep us um, energetic in the morning and let us rest and have really good sleep at night. Right. Cause we need that cycle. We need the cortisol at the right time in the morning instead of the wrong time at night. And, um, is, is it generally a progress? Like it sounded like you were talking about a progression. Like I would, I'm picturing like a, a CEO burnout, you know, or kind of mom burnout kind of thing where you're stressed, 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 and then your body starts to adapt and you just get all messed up all over the place. And then you're just sunk. <laughs> does, does it progress like that for many people? For many people that I've worked with, it does seem to progress that way where they might go through a period of a lot of stress. Like let's say you have a new baby and um, you, know, you can't sleep. You're taking care of that baby. You're kind of like, you're, you're, you know, fueled by adrenaline, right? That's kind of the initial stages of it where um, that can happen. And then after a while of, of the baby not sleeping, <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh, now I'm so, so tired, right? So that is definitely a way that things can progress for a lot of people. For some people, the progression might be very quick. So they're, they're in that like high anxiety state just for a short time period, a few days, few months, and then they progress to that fatigue cycle for other people. It might be decades, right? Mm, but all of them are signs that the adrenals aren't functioning properly and can use intervention to stop from prog progressing further, I imagine. Um, how do we know the difference between, um, well, duh, I'm tired, Isabella, because I have a baby who's waking up three times a night. Is that, like, how do we tell the difference between normal, you know, fatigue, normal tiredness, and something that should be a red flag? I think... It's tricky because people say, oh, well, everybody's tired when they have kids and that's super common, right? Yeah. But is it normal, right? And so is it normal to be tired? And I would say I, um, speaking from my own experience, when my son was eight months old and he was waking up a lot throughout the night, still like four times a night, I was super, super drained and I was exhausted. I just couldn't, I couldn't do much other than like, you know, wake up with him and take care of him and, and whatnot. And there are things you can actually do to support your body through that sleep deprived state. So there are vitamins and nutrients that you can, that you burn through as a new sleep deprived mom, that when you do restore them, you feel better and you have more energy. And yes, you're going to be tired, 
but maybe your brain works a little bit better and maybe you're not so anxious. So there's definitely, um, I feel like a spectrum of it where if you're having trouble functioning, if you're having trouble waking up in the morning, you're feeling, you're feeling irritable. You're feeling like you're not, not enjoying the process. Those could all be signs that, um, perhaps you might need a little bit more support. Mm -hmm. So if you're tired, don't let people tell you that it's normal, that it's okay. Read books like the adrenal protocol, you know, and figure out if you can help yourself feel less tired. I, I do love in the book, Dr. Isabella, where you say a lot of, a lot of people say this is normal because many people are experiencing it, but that doesn't mean it's normal, i.e. the way we are supposed to be. It just means it's common. And just because everybody's doing it, we were told in high school, doesn't mean we need to, right? Same thing applies here. Just because everybody's feeling tired doesn't mean you have to be stuck there. Um, do you think that women are more affected than men? I, I feel like I've heard you say that before. And why would that be a, a gender, more gendered role? Um, so definitely looking at the at kind of the research and statistics of of and the official medical term is HPA axis dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Um, is that it is tends to be more common in women. I think we're just better tuned into our environment. And this makes sense because we have to carry the babies and it's always more beneficial to, um, our body's always helping us to survive. And if we're in a situation like a famine or a war or something super stressful going on, then our bodies are going to be tuned into that because if, you know, it's much easier to survive a, a famine when you're not pregnant, right? And when you don't have to take care of a new um, baby. And so a lot of the things that um, a lot of the stressors in our environment, women's bodies just really pick up on really, really well. And our body's always trying to help us conserve energy and resources. So this is this is a big thing that I see in the women that I work with. And some of the research does support that as well. Mm, I actually love that perspective. It's kind of like, you know, nature or God or whatever you feel is in charge is saying women are important. This is the, you know, preservation of our species. And we're, we're going to give them a little extra, <laughs> a little extra, which unfortunately that little extra can sometimes pull us down. It means we need more care. Right. And I, uh, there's a story in your book about you're, you're from Poland. And so that Eastern European background, and you learned a few years into being in America that how are you didn't mean what you thought it meant. And it's such a good analogy for, I think, how many of us women are taught to sort of push our emotions down. Can you share that story? It's so cute. Sure. And I was actually 25, maybe 26 when I learned that. And I had already been in the States for 15 years. Oh, but I, um, it's funny because in Europe, we ask people, we ask, how are you doing? And then we tell each other, we go through and we say like, this is how I'm feeling. I had a tough day or everything is going well. And this is what I'm concerned with. And then I would, um, I was working with this um, gentleman and he was, he was an older gentleman and, and he was coming to talk to me about his um, client's medications. I was a pharmacist on staff for um, a group of social workers and he would say, hi, Dr. Wentz, how are you? And I like started talking and telling him how I was actually doing. And I was like, oh, I have this consult coming up. I'm a little bit, you know, whatever. And then he kind of looked at me and goes, okay, well, I'm here to talk about blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, wait, you didn't like, that's actually just a greeting. And it's just, it's just, I feel like emblematic of our society is we're told to just like smile and go on about our day and like, not let anybody know that we're, we're struggling. It's like, you're complaining you're not appreciating what you have in life. And so many other people have it far worse than you, where the research shows that like the women that have girlfriends and talk to their girlfriends about whatever's going on in their lives or, or other kind of friends or therapists, they're the ones that end up um, being healthier and more resilient, no matter if they have issues in their life or not. So if you hold it all in, that's going to be, um, that's going to be so inflammatory to you if you don't get that, get that, um, stress out. Right. Mm -hmm. And the emotional and mental impacts, the physical, that's, that's the key here is that you're not just making yourself emotionally or mentally unhealthy by not talking about your problems or not having friends, you know, with whom you can really connect, but you can actually physically make your body sick. I mean, it's so fascinating. We actually have a whole interview on friendship with Janine Halloran. So we'll be sure to link to that. But um, I know we, we had to start talking about what we can do. All right. So we've talked about, here's our problems. We're too tired. 
we're we're putting on the happy face. How are you? Fine. How are you? Busy. That's that's like the classic answer now, right? I try so hard not to say busy because I just feel like it's a it's a cop out. I'd rather say fine, even though that's a lie too. But what can we do? What can, other than telling you know the sixty year old guy who says how are you? How we're actually doing? Let's let's um <laughs> let's go with something that would work a little better. And your approach is different than most. I, I just can't wait to hear about the safety signals for your body. Sure. So when I think about when we are in this survival mode and that, um, you know, we might be tired, we might be wired. We just feel like we're overwhelmed and stressed and there's just so much going on in our lives and we're so, so busy. It's challenging to like find and create the space for healing because your, your plate is already so full, right? When you have a job, a family, um, you know, whatever else, a life going on, maybe a social life or a health issue that you need to take care of. It's really easy to put yourself last. So I, um, you know, my, my approach used to be like, if you have fatigue, then go ahead and quit coffee and get rid of all the things that are bothering you in your life and sleep for 12 hours a night and maybe take some hormones. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, it's kind of hard to do with a newborn, right? It's like, obviously this is the source of why I'm not sleeping. I'm not going to like get rid of my newborn. I <laughs> like love my, you know, love my family, love my children. So um, kind of recognizing where the stress signals are coming in your life and seeing if we can modify them. We, we can't always modify them, right? If there's like a super toxic person in your life, maybe getting rid of them can be super, super helpful. Not always realistic when we have, um, children or when we need to go to jobs. So this, the different approaches, looking at where we can create some safety for ourselves and create some of these safety signals. There are things, for example, for tired moms going outside on a stroller walk with a baby um, is a great thing to do first thing in the morning. So you can get some bright lights into your body and that can be a way to naturally release some the right amounts of stress hormones at the right time to give yourself a little bit more energy. Now, if a stroller walk is too much, then maybe it's like going out on your patio and putting the, the baby in a rocker and drinking some coffee. Like that works too, as long as you're like getting some of that sunshine into your body. Um, and then figuring out like, what are the other little doses of joy or happiness that you can send your body? Big, big part of it is going to be nutrition. So making sure that you are eating protein and fat every few hours throughout your day, um, doing things that are supportive of the, of the nutrients that get burned out through stress. These are going to be our B vitamins, vitamin C and magnesium. These things can be huge, huge game changers for um, feeling like, Hey, I am exhausted by all the stuff I have to do to I have a lot of stuff going on and it's okay. I'm capable. Sometimes it's like taking an Epsom salt bath or taking a magnesium supplement can be the difference between like feeling overwhelmed to feeling capable and like you're able to, um, to stay on top of your game. Right. It's amazing that you just food can be a safety signal. Like my brain is kind of turning that one around that it's like from the inside out, kind of, you're feeling your body feels more safe or more capable when it's well-nourished. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And I think one of the, one of the like earth shattering moments that some of my clients will have is what happens when you actually eat enough protein and fat throughout the day, you feel so calm. You feel like if you had anxiety, sometimes that's all you need to do is to make sure that your blood sugar balance throughout the day to not have anxiety anymore. I had um, one of my women that was going through the adrenal transformation program. She said, you know, the 3 PM is like the worst time for me. I get this like really bad anxiety. And it's right when I have to pick up my daughter from school and I wait in the car line and it's just like the anxiety just builds. And one of the very simple things we did for her is right around like between two and before she had to leave to pick up her daughter, we just gave her a smoothie and it was coconut milk, a little bit of protein powder, um, as well as some, some other things like a little bit of fruit, whatever, to make it tasty and enjoyable. And she would have that. And she's like that 3 PM crash is gone. Like I show up and I have energy and I don't have issues with like, you know, feeling anxious or feeling tired. And sometimes it's just making sure 
we have a little bit of snack in between. And I know we give our kids snacks all the time. Like, you know what happens when a toddler is hangry, right? Um, <laughs> so same thing for, for adults and especially adults that are under stress and they have a lot going on in our lives. We forget to eat. And sometimes that could just send our um, blood sugar crashing. And then we end up being anxious, irritable, tired, all of these things and overwhelmed. And sometimes like just doing something like that, or, or I'll have like a maca latte, which is um, a little bit of coconut milk, a little bit of hot water and a bit of maca for, for people that tolerate with that tolerate it. And that just sends a nice safety signal to the body that like, Hey, we're not starving. Hey, we don't have to like, you know, hunt for food. We don't have to be anxious about food. Sure. Okay. I can totally see how that's a safety signal because when we're not worried, our body isn't worried. It's obviously below the level of consciousness that, yeah, we're going to starve or something. Um, I know when it, when it comes to food, we always talk about food as medicine and and that's a good thing. You know, you're, you're the pharmacologist. Um, we had another guest on Dr. Renee Wellenstein who talked about adrenals and her point of view is that we shouldn't cut any food groups from our diet while healing. I think you have a different perspective, which is totally cool because people are different. Right. Um, but you even go into that time of day, like that 3 PM is, is there, um, is there something that would apply to most or all women and men who are having some adrenal dysfunction as far as when to eat certain nutrients for that blood sugar balance? Sure. So my approach is focusing on figuring out what's sending your body stress signals and not eating, not eating enough food can do that. Eating junk food or eating food that is inflammatory to you can do that. Eat, not having enough nutrients on board can do that. And having foods that are too high in carbohydrates, not enough with, without enough protein and fat to balance that out. These can all be stress signals to your body. So my approach is very much focused on figuring out, like if you are, if you know that you're gluten sensitive or dairy sensitive, you know that if you eat that kind of food, you're going to, you're going to have issues with it. It could cause anxiety. It could cause um, you to have digestive distress. It's going to cause inflammation in your body. So part of that is knowing what, what works for you, what doesn't, right. Making sure that you're eating frequently enough throughout the day that you're ut utilizing enough of the macronutrients. Um, and then also some of the, some of the, like the hacks of utilizing foods throughout different parts of the day is in the morning time, if you have trouble with morning fatigue, a lot of times you could have um, low cortisol and low blood sugar and maybe even low blood pressure in the morning. And so utilizing something like an adrenal um, kickstart drink where you have a little bit of OJ that has um, glucose, but also to raise your blood sugar very quickly um, to give you a little bit of that energy, but also combining that with with some electrolytes to help you support a healthy blood pressure. When our blood pressure is too low, we don't have enough. Um, we may not have enough energy. And that's, that's oftentimes what I see in people with, with that kind of dysfunctional pattern and then adding some protein and fat to that so that you don't have this like exaggerated blood sugar response. So I'll, I'll have people add a little bit of a protein powder, maybe some coconut milk and some electrolytes to about a half a cup of OJ. Um, and that can do the trick of helping you have a little bit more energy without having caffeine and also helping you stay more stable and less anxious in the morning and to set yourself up for a healthy day. I love how practical that is. And so many people in, you know, mainstream society gravitate toward that orange juice in the morning. And most of the time, what we hear, I would say from the integrative, you know, crowd or whatever is, oh, don't drink orange juice. It's going to spike your blood sugar. But you're saying, here's how you can hack that, right? Here's how you can add this, that, and the other thing to try to like properly raise your blood sugar, give yourself a little energy, but do it in a smart way. Not like my dad who eats orange juice, a banana and cereal in the morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, how are you still alive? <laughs> now, what about, what about supplements, Dr. Isabella? Cause obviously you're a pharmacist. So you kind of started with the drugs only method and you've transformed a lot, but I know you do. I know you're a fan of supplementing and you've, you've mentioned that a little bit. If you could just recommend one or two, what would those be? Definitely. If you have a adrenal dysfunction, if you're finding yourself irritable and fatigued and stressed out and overwhelmed, taking an adaptogen 
like an adaptogenic herb can be incredibly helpful. One herb is ashwagandha. And I always say like adaptogens make everybody around us more nice, right? Because when we're like feeling calm and not stressed and just in a happy state, everything is easier. Everything just seems easier around us versus if like, if I'm having a bad day and I'm rushing, I'm, you know, going to the, going to the store and I'm like, did that lady just give me an attitude? Right? Like, why is that person giving me a hard time when, um, and when we're, we're more balanced, we can kind of show up and say like, huh, that, that woman looks like she's having a tough day. I'm just, I'm just going to say something nice, going to take an extra moment. And then all of a sudden you find out like, you know, that, something happened with her dog that morning and she's really struggling and she's just so gracious and grateful for you to like say something nice to her and it just your whole day can transform like that and that's the power of adaptogens so adaptogenic herbs can help us be more resilient to stress and help us just give us like an extra few seconds of being like okay maybe this isn't so bad i have a little bit more energy i have a little bit more peace of mind where i can show up in the world in a healthier state. And, and that impacts everybody around me too. Wow. It sounds like it allows you to be less reactive, less like, you know, quickly, angrily reactive. It's like an empathy pill or something. That's really cool. Um, now what about sleep? We haven't talked, we, we, we've talked about sleep when you've said, yes, I used to tell people sleep for 12 hours (laughs) and you've changed your tune because that's not always realistic. What is like the most important thing for people suffering from adrenal dysfunction to, to consider when we're thinking about sleep? There, um, there, and there's just so many different stages that we can be on, whether we're teenagers or children or, um, young adults working and then having, having our own young children and then ha- going into like perimenopause, right. And then menopause where some of our progesterone gets too low, and then actually benef- we could benefit from a progesterone supplement to help us sleep. But I think w- some of the things that I really focus on with people is making sure that your blood sugar balance throughout the day, that's going to help you wake up throughout the night. People who have um, frequent night wakings or the night wakings between two and 3 a.m. Um, same goes for little kids too. That could be a sign of blood sugar and. Imp- carbohydrates a night, eating, um, some helpful for, um, for sustaining sleep and getting into a good sleep pattern that, um, that is like one of the, I guess the tricks or hacks or like secrets to actually sleeping better at night and getting sleep. That's more refreshing is when you are blood sugar balanced. And then I also, um, I also, you know, it's, it's interesting because people will say like, I tried like everything, Um, everybody says sleep in a dark room and I do this and I do that. And so I go through a checklist of lifestyle changes that could be completely life-changing, like making sure that you have blacked out every blue light in your room for some people that that's completely it, but there's also like individual factors to consider. So if you're somebody that has the blood sugar issues, that might be relevant for you. If you're somebody that's perimenopausal, perhaps progesterone might be relevant for you. Um, and so I, I have a lot of different, um, kind of scenarios too, that I focus on in my book. We have, we have like a four week protocol and that helps most people, but I also tailor it to the individual. Cause I, I get a lot of people that are like, uh, I tried everything and I'm like, okay, but you have this, this, and that. And then we give them this specific protocol and they're like, okay, that works. Thank you. That's great to hear. I love that your top sleep tip had to do with food and not sleep at all. It's just such a beautiful example of how functional medicine is the whole person, right? It's not take the supplement for sleep, do this right before you sleep. It's, you know, fix the way your body's feeling. And amazingly, it will give you the sleep that it knows you need. Um, You have kind of a unique ending to your four R's in your book, your replenish, re-energize, revitalize, and rebuild resilience. So maybe we can finish with that resilience idea and what that really means for us tired mamas. (sighs) Sure. So there's there certain things that we do in life or that we have going on in our lives that take our energy. And I focus on helping people create more energy. And, you know, we could say like, if you're stressed out, go live in a monastery and meditate all day. Right. But that would that like, 
Is that the right thing for everybody? Would that probably help? That would probably help your stress levels, but that's not realistic. So we live in the modern world, right? And so we can't get rid of every single stressful thing in our lives. And so we need to figure out how to make ourselves stronger, right? And more resilient to stress because we're always going to have that stress. And part of what I talked about was doing things like adrenal adaptogens. That can be a helpful short-term thing to consider when we're under um, periods of stress, but also looking at what are the things in our lives, current lives or past lives that are draining our energy and how do we build resilience? Part of that one example might be setting boundaries, right? If you have somebody that is constantly draining your energy, whether that's like a toxic friend or toxic neighbor, considering setting some boundaries with that person, maybe what you need to do in your life. If you have a history of past trauma, childhood trauma, where you get, or, you know, early adult trauma or any, any kind of trauma, really, where you get easily triggered by something and you become very reactive, that's a big drain on your energy and your vitality. So working through to get rid of that past trauma may be what you need to, to have in that situation. Um, other things that can build resilience would be things like doing muscle-based exercise, right? So when we do like biking and um, cardio and running, that has a catabolic impact on our bodies. But when we do strength training, like lifting weights and yoga, things of that nature that build muscle, that actually does build resilience in our physical bodies. And many people say like yoga can build resent resilience in our mental, in our, in our heads as well. Right. How cool. So building strength in one's body can build ultimately strengthen your mind because you're just more resilient as a human being. Is that kind of how to think about that? Um, definitely. So let's say if you're working on a skill and maybe that's yoga and you're, you've been working in like a getting like a headstand going and whatnot. And that teaches you to breathe and take your time and to go through that process of like, Hey, I can't do this yet. And this is really hard for me, but I can do hard things. It's a, it's a progress, not perfection. So yeah, things, you know, weight, weight training and exercise um, of that nature where you're building on that can definitely teach us how to be more resilient in our day-to-day -day life. So a lot of times if I've, if I've done yoga, I can think back to like, okay, what, what do we do when we're in a tough situation? We take deep breaths and we slow our breath down. And so you can translate that into like your life when, um, you know, my son is having a hard time with something and, and screaming and yelling and really upset. It's like, okay, what do I need to do? Let me center myself. Let me take some deep breaths and pretend I'm in yoga class and this is hard. And, but you know, you, you end up being able to carry that on into your day-to-day -day life. And maybe the best part about that for us parents is not only I mean, what you just taught is like for the adult, but oh my goodness, parents, this is how we can teach our children, right? So our children need to be setting big goals, doing hard things, celebrating the progress, not the perfection and all of those things, right? As, as parent to child, that's how we teach them to build resilience the earlier they can build resilience, the, the better they're going to feel and the better they're going to do in life. Like it's just, oh my gosh, resilience, so, so important. So you just gave us a perfect prescription for what we want to do both for ourselves and for our kids. And I'm, I love, um, I really want everyone to get connected with you. Everyone should get the adrenal transformation protocol, but first, what gift do you have for our readers so that we can like get connected with you online? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have the ABCs of adrenals. And this is a quick guide that talks about some of the things we talked about, what kind of nutrients get burned through stress. And when we replenish those nutrients, we feel better. So we have more energy, our brains work better, we can sleep better. And these are B vitamins, vitamin C, as well as magnesium. And then the, the A in that is like the adaptogens. So I talk about different types of adaptogens people can take and which benefits each one might have. So there's some ones that are like, Hey, I'm having some libido issues. Okay. Th this is, this is going to be the direction you'll want to go like maca or shatavari. And then we talk about like a um, variety of different ones to support your body. And people can get that at thyroidpharmacist.com slash ABC. And it's just a quick free guide to get you started. The ABCs, th that sounds like a very practical and perfect way to kind of tie in a lot of what we talked about in case people, you know, are just listening on the run and they weren't able to take notes. 
go get that. Dr. Isabella took your notes and expanded them for you with all her wisdom. Now, when I end a healthy parenting connector, I always like to leave parents with like one practical step because we talk about so much and it can be like, oh yeah, that was all great, but I have no time for anything, right? What, what would be like the one first step that you would want any busy parent to do today before their head hits the pillow to like notice or see or improve adrenal uh, function? One of the things that can be incredibly helpful is if you take a bath at night or if you um, do anything like that, if you have that time, add in some Epsom salts into your bath. That's a great way to get your magnesium levels up. Magnesium gets quickly depleted when we're under stress. Um, this can relieve your muscle cramps. This could relieve your anxiety. This could help you sleep better at night. If you have menstrual cramps, this can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. If you do have that opportunity, I would highly recommend that. That is a good one. Um, do magnesium lotions and sprays have a similar impact? You can definitely do a magnesium supplement and you can take a magnesium lotion and spray. Now, some people love them. I will say that um, my husband likes it more than I do. Like if I shave my legs, it, kind of, it can kind of like burn. So um, just to be aware of that, maybe putting it on the bottom of your feet. Cause I know people have been like, I've tried, like men love it. And then women are like, but it burns my legs. I'm like, I, I hear you sister. So bottom of your feet is maybe where you want to put that. That's a great tip. I know. I think the spray for me, I mean, I've tried a number of brands of both. I think the sprays tend to be a little bit more burning. I know magnesium lotion shop is definitely a favorite. If you haven't tried it, I have never felt any burning from that even after shaving. So I might, I might have to connect you to Mike over there. <laughs> yes, please. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom and your energy today, Dr. Isabella. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Katie, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. All right, healthy, happy mamas out there. I'm Katie Kimball for Kids Cook Real Food. And as always here at the Healthy Parenting Connector, we're here to connect you, parents who really want to raise healthy, independent kids who grow into healthy, independent adults. And today, we helped you take a little more care of yourself so that you have a fuller cup and you can better pour out into your family and also I think some really good strategies for raising healthier, resilient kids. So this was awesome, Dr. Isabella. And guys, I will see you next time.